Welcome to section 41 of bacteria. This is our bacteria overview figure, and in this video we'll be discussing Mycobacterium tuberculosis, or simply TB, which you can see right here. This scene will take place inside of a home as this guy begins to prepare dinner. Notice that there's a pan with some smoke in the air behind him, and that he's holding a bunch of tubers, as if getting ready to cook them. Tuber sounds like tuberculosis, so the guy holding the tubers will be our symbol for Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Next, notice that we've added a TV to the image. As you can see, the news is on, and there appears to be a terrorist attack with a car bomb explosion. We can see the news reporter off to the side with a prominent microphone. Just like in some of our other videos, the microphone is here to help you remember that Mycobacterium tuberculosis has mycolic acid in its cell wall. You can also see that there is a bunch of green acid spewing out of the car as a result of the car bomb. The acid is here to help you remember that TB is an acid-fast bacillus. And as is perhaps most obvious, this whole news report is about the car bomb explosion. Just like in our Nocardia image, the car bomb is here to help you remember carbal fusion. This is a red staining reagent that is used as one of the steps in the acid fast stain. So car bomb for carbal fusion. This is an acid fast stain of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Notice that the organism appears bright red, which you can see for example right here, after staining and that there is a blue background. All right, now notice that we've added a little girl to the image. She appears to be having a pretty fun time sitting on top of this autographed basketball. If you look closely at the ball, you can see that it's signed by LeBron James. The letters L and J in LeBron James should help you remember Lowenstein Jensen Medium. So TB can be grown in Lowenstein Jensen Medium. This is an image of Lowenstein Jensen Medium inside of a bottle. Okay, now that we've covered many of the basic features of TB, let's move on to discuss the pathophysiology. You may have heard of many different forms of TB, such as primary TB, secondary TB, miliary TB, latent TB, and primary progressive TB. Kind of a lot. All these names and the specifics around them can be pretty confusing. However, if you logically understand the pathophysiology, it's so much easier to memorize. So before making you blindly memorize this information, let me help you logically understand it first. This is an image outlining the pathophysiology of TB. So to begin, the organism must first be inhaled through aerosolized droplets, as we've shown right here. Because this is the initial exposure of the patient to the pathogen, we've shown that here. As you can see, once the inhaled organisms are in the alveoli, they encounter alveolar macrophages. Normally, pathogens are engulfed by phagocytosis and then destroyed as the phagosome and lysosome fuse. However, TB has a virulence factor known as cord factor that prevents this from occurring. So the pathogen is permitted to replicate within macrophages. In this image, we've shown that phagolysosome fusion is inhibited by the red X right here. So TB is permitted to continue proliferating intracellularly. Shortly after the initial exposure, the alveolar macrophages travel to the lymphatic system. This elicits an immune response within the lymph nodes and is responsible for hyalur lymphadenopathy within the lungs. Here the macrophages present TB antigens on their surface to naive T cells. As you can see, the diagram has a branching point here, but let's ignore this for a moment and focus on what most commonly happens. So the macrophage produces IL-12, which induces naive T cells to become T helper type 1 cells, or TH1 cells. TH1 cells release interferon gamma, which is a crucial cytokine responsible for fully activating macrophages. So you can see that we've shown fully activated macrophages right here. Notice that this doesn't occur immediately after the pathogen is inhaled. Rather, it takes several weeks. So several weeks later, macrophages are fully activated and then can perform two important functions. One, they form fully acidified phagolysosomes, which are capable of destroying the pathogen. So phagolysosome destruction of TB. And two, they form granulomas that wall off the infection. So granuloma formation occurs. This entire pathway that we just covered is considered primary TB. So the patient is exposed to the pathogen, it travels to the lymph nodes, and then macrophages are fully activated. Most of the time, a patient with primary TB is asymptomatic. Eventually, many pathogens are destroyed and the remaining pathogens are walled off by granulomas. So if a patient has a strong immune system, primary TB resolves through granuloma formation and fibrosis of lung tissue. And this is then referred to as latent TB. It's latent because the pathogens are still present in the host, they're just suppressed by macrophages and adequately contained by granulomas. However, over time, the patient's immune system may weaken with age or disease, and when this occurs, the latent TB may become reactivated. So if the patient has a weak immune system, he or she may develop secondary TB. This is also sometimes referred to as reactivation TB, because the TB was latent, but now active once more. 
Hopefully this makes sense. The immune system was successfully containing the organism through granulomas and activated macrophages. But now that the immune system has weakened, granulomas are not properly formed and the pathogen is permitted to spread. It's only in secondary TB that the patient develops the classic symptoms of night sweats, fever, hemoptysis, and weight loss, which we've shown right here in the diagram. Like I mentioned earlier, primary TB is usually asymptomatic. Once a patient has secondary TB, they're at risk of developing hematogenous spread of the organism. And if this occurs, the disease is referred to as miliary TB. This is the most severe form of TB because it spreads throughout the entire body and often affects multiple organs. This is an image of miliary TB affecting the spleen. As you can see, the spleen is covered in small white nodules that resemble millet seeds, which is why this form of TB is referred to as miliary TB. The final form of TB we'll discuss is primary progressive TB. This usually occurs in an immunocompromised patient who is unable to effectively mount a cell-mediated response during the initial exposure. So rather than developing fully activated macrophages, the organism is unable to be adequately contained and spreads hematogenously to other organisms. So it's basically a form of miliary TB that occurs during the initial exposure. Okay, now that you understand the pathophysiology, let's continue discussing the image to help you memorize these details. Remember the smoke above the pan in the kitchen? This is here to help you remember that TB enters the lower lobes of the lungs via aerosolized droplets. Now you can see that we've added a cage for the family's pet snake right next to the TV. The cage is a symbol for macrophages, so this is here to help you remember that once TB is inhaled, it enters the alveoli and is engulfed by alveolar macrophages. Here the pathogen then begins to replicate within the macrophages, so it replicates intracellularly. Next, if you look closely at the TV, you can see that there is a cord that's going from the base of the TV towards the wall by the snake cage, where it's most likely plugged into an outlet. The cord is here to help you remember cord factor, which is a virulence factor produced by TB that forms micelles that surround and protect the organisms from the phagolysosome within macrophages. The fact that the cord is next to the snake cage should help you remember that these micelles create what's known as a serpentine cord appearance under the microscope because they resemble snakes. This is an acid fast stain of TB at a thousand times magnification, and we can see that the organisms are growing right next to each other in a wavy pattern that resembles a serpent, and this is known as a serpentine cord. Again, there is a strong correlation of virulence with this pattern of growth because the micelles responsible for this phenomenon protect the pathogens from phagolysosome destruction. All right, now notice that we've shown a guy towards the back of the image that appears to be doing some laundry. We can see that he has a container of Tide on the counter, but has accidentally spilled a bunch of it onto the ground. Tide sounds like sulfatide, and should help you remember that TB produces another virulence factor known as sulfatide. Sulfatides are surface glycoproteins that prevent phagolysosome fusion and protect TB from lysosomal degradation. To help you remember this, we've shown tide bleach on the floor that has spilled into separate puddles. So I guess you could say that none of the puddles have fused together, just like sulfatides prevent fusion of the phagosome and lysosome. This prevents macrophages from destroying the pathogen and allows the organism to survive intracellularly. The fact that this guy is cleaning or purifying his clothes should help you remember the purified protein derivative, or PPD test. This is a test that can be useful in determining if the patient has had prior exposure to TB, such as someone with a latent infection. So Guy purifying his clothes for the purified protein derivative test. This is an image of the PPD test, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with by now. The test is performed by injecting tuberculin material into the skin. If the patient has had prior exposure to TB, then a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction will occur as T lymphocytes migrate to the area and cause induration at the injection site. This is why the patient returns within 48 to 72 hours and someone evaluates the induration at the injection site. The diameter of the induration and not the erythema should be measured. There are different cutoffs for a positive test, but typically in a normal individual without risk factors, an induration of 15 millimeters or greater is considered a positive test. All right, also notice that the guy is holding a syringe. Let's zoom up so you can see this better. As you can see, he's using the syringe to inject tide bleach onto his clothes. We've been using syringes in our other videos to represent vaccines. So the syringe is in this video to help you remember the Bacille Calmet Guerin, or BCG vaccine. This is a vaccine for tuberculosis that's often administered in foreign countries. However, the efficacy is variable, and the risks generally outweigh the benefits for people born in the United States. So it's typically not administered in the U.S. Because the BCG vaccine contains tuberculin antigens, it will trigger the adaptive immune system and forever cause these individuals to have false positive PPD tests. So guy with a syringe for the BCG vaccine causes false positive PPD tests. Finally, notice that we've shown green rays emanating from the laundry machine buttons. 
The green rays are kind of like gamma rays and are here to help you remember the interferon gamma release assay, or IGRA. This is an alternative test that can be performed for individuals that have had the BCG vaccine and results in fewer false positives than the PPD test. Okay, now let's turn our attention back to the girl sitting on top of the basketball. As you can see, she's having a great time making lots of noise and banging a gong so that nobody can listen to the news. Gong sounds like gone complex and is here to help you remember that a gone complex may form during primary TB. This is defined as simply hilar lymphadenopathy and a granuloma that forms in the parenchyma of the lung. Like we discussed earlier, hilar lymphadenopathy occurs because antigen-presenting cells migrate from the alveoli to the pulmonary lymph nodes and elicit an immune response, causing the pulmonary lymph nodes to enlarge. The granuloma that forms in the parenchyma of the lung occurs several weeks after the initial exposure, after macrophages are fully activated. This is a chest x-ray of a GON complex. The enhancement that's closest to the heart right here is hilar lymphadenopathy, and further away right here is a parenchymal granuloma. All right, now you can see that we've added two more characters to the scene. As you can see, there is a girl that's sleeping on the couch. She's here to help you remember latent TB. The older lady that's sitting up and holding the remote is the grandma of the rambunctious child on the basketball. And she's here to help you remember that the infection usually becomes latent as granulomas wall off the pathogen. Also, if you look closely at the blanket, you can see that there are many fibrous ends near the floor. The fibrous ends should make you think of the word fibrosis and are here to help you remember that the infection usually becomes latent as the infected lung tissue becomes fibrotic. Finally, notice that the grandma has a remote in her hand. Let's zoom up so you can see this better. Notice that it says TNT on it. This is the name of a television network, but the abbreviation is similar to TNF. So the TNT remote is here to help you remember TNF alpha. TNF alpha is an important cytokine that contributes to the formation of granulomas. So it's partially responsible for causing latent TB. Likewise, this is also why when a patient takes a TNF-alpha inhibitor, granuloma formation is disrupted and can awaken the infection from its latent state. So just think of the grandma holding the TNT remote and being able to adjust the volume on the TV, thereby waking up the person that's sleeping. All right, before we go any further, pay special attention to how we've organized the image so far. Everything on the main floor of this house represents general information about TB, as well as primary TB. The exception to this are the two people on the couch right here. They represent latent TB. The information that will occur on the stairs over here will be used to represent secondary TB. So hopefully, the way we've organized this should allow you to easily compartmentalize the information and recall it more easily. Okay, now let's move on to discuss secondary TB. To start, notice that we've shown a skinny, emaciated kid who quickly grabbed something from the kitchen and is running up the stairs. The skinny, emaciated kid is here to help you remember that secondary TB occurs as health declines and the patient's immune system becomes weaker. The fact that all of the information regarding secondary TB is occurring up the stairs should help you remember that secondary TB affects the upper lobes of the lungs. So upstairs for upper lobes of the lungs. Why this occurs is actually not very well understood. It may be due to relatively poor lymphatic flow in this region resulting in poor organism clearance, or it may be because TB prefers the higher oxygen tensions in the upper lobes. However, it's not certain whether or not TB is an obligate aerobe, so this theory may not hold much weight. Regardless, you should know that secondary TB affects the upper lobes of the lungs. You may have been wondering why this kid so quickly grabbed some food and ran up the stairs. Well, he's a stepchild and not very loved, so they don't give him very much food. This is why from time to time he runs down the stairs very quickly and steals food. The fact that he's always deprived of food should help you remember that he's super skinny and has lost a lot of weight. So secondary TB often presents with weight loss. He was running very quickly, and so if you look closely, you can see that he's broken out of sweat. The sweat is here to help you remember that secondary TB presents with night sweats. He was also so hungry that he immediately began stuffing tubers in his mouth, and now we can see that his mouth is covered in red beets. The red color around his mouth should help you remember that secondary TB presents with hemoptysis. Finally, notice that we've added a heater at the top of the stairs. Just like in our prior videos, the heater or heat lamp is used to represent fever. So secondary TB presents with a fever. All right, now that we've covered secondary TB, let's move on to discuss miliary TB and primary progressive TB. As you can see, we've added a pot, a bag of millet, and some ripe rotten food on the counter. The kid grabbed the ripe food so fast that he accidentally knocked over the bag of millet and the pot of water. In any case, the bag of millet is here to help you remember miliary TB. Like I mentioned earlier, this is simply hematogenous spread of the organism and may occur following secondary TB or during the initial exposure, which is known as 
primary progressive TV. This is why we've shown the bag of millet seeds on the first floor, but still connected to the skinny kid on the second floor. So the millet seeds getting spilled on the first floor should make you think of primary progressive TB. And the fact that it was knocked over by the kid on the second floor should make you think of secondary TB. Also, the pot of water should make you think of pot disease. This is a form of TB that occurs in the vertebrae as the organism spreads hematogenously to the spinal column. So pot disease may be seen in miliary TB. Now you can see that we've added a hat underneath all of the millet seeds. I guess the emaciated kid accidentally dropped his hat in his haste. Anyway, if you look closely at the hat, you can see that the weight of the millet seeds are causing the hat to dip downward, kind of like a cavity. So if you think of the hat as a symbol for the brain, then this should help you remember that cavitary brain lesions may be seen in miliary TB. In reality, many other organs may be affected in miliary TB, such as the spleen, liver, or others. However, pot disease and cavitary brain lesions are some of the most worthwhile memorizing, which is why we've included this information in the image. Okay, now let's wrap up this image by discussing treatment. As you can see, when the emaciated kid grabbed some ripe food, he accidentally stepped on some, causing a huge red smear to cover his tracks. This smear of ripe food on the ground is here to help you remember ripe therapy. R stands for rifampin, I stands for isoniazid, P stands for pyrazinamide, and E stands for ethambutol. We've intentionally made this streak of ripe food covering the area by the millet seeds, the first floor of the house, and extending up to the stairs to help you remember that ripe therapy should be used for primary, secondary, and miliary TB infections. Finally, notice that we've added a decorative rifle right behind the person sleeping. Just like in our other videos, the rifle is here to help you remember rifampin. Also, the grandma is holding a glass of ice water, and I should help you remember isoniazid. The fact that the rifle and glass of ice are right next to the sleeping person should help you remember that rifampin and isoniazid alone can be used for latent TB. All right, now that we've covered the image, let's review with a question. A 57-year-old woman who immigrated to the U.S. from Thailand several years ago presents to the emergency department due to night sweats, fevers, and weight loss. She states that she first noticed her symptoms approximately one week ago. Her past medical history is significant for rheumatoid arthritis that is well controlled with infliximab. Physical examination shows axillary lymphadenopathy. A chest x-ray reveals a pulmonary infiltrate in the upper lobe of the left lung. This patient's condition can be best explained by which of the following? A. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. B. Uncontrolled proliferation of Reed-Sternberg cells. C. Granuloma dysfunction. Or D. Polymorphonuclear invasion of alveolar tissue. Okay, let me highlight a few points from the question stem. She is from Thailand. She has had night sweats, fevers, and weight loss. She's being treated with a TNF-alpha inhibitor infliximab, and a chest x-ray revealed a pulmonary infiltrate in the upper lobe of the left lung. Collectively, these clues are highly suggestive of secondary TB. She likely contracted the infection when in Thailand and has had a latent infection since then. Then, after taking infliximab, the granulomas that were containing the infection were disrupted, and she developed reactivation TB, or secondary TB. So the correct answer is C, granuloma dysfunction. From the image, recall that the person sleeping on the couch right here represents latent TB. And the remote that says TNT right here is here to help you remember that TNF-alpha inhibitors can increase the risk of secondary TB by disrupting granuloma formation. A is incorrect because while idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis can affect the lungs and cause shortness of breath, it's unlikely to cause fever, night sweats, and weight loss. So A is incorrect. B is describing cells that are associated with Hodgkin lymphoma. Lymphoma is classically associated with fevers, night sweats, and weight loss, but it's unlikely to cause pulmonary infiltrates. Also, the fact that this patient is taking a TNF-alpha inhibitor and is from Thailand makes TB more likely. So B is incorrect. Finally, D is incorrect because this is describing pneumonia. Pneumonia may cause a pulmonary infiltrate on a chest x-ray, but is unlikely to cause night sweats and weight loss. So D is incorrect. So again, the correct answer is C, granuloma dysfunction. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know about mycobacterium tuberculosis.